a pleasant afternoon to all. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the opening of the Omexena lecture series. Some of you might have attended first Omexena last March. That was an information field premiere of the Omexena platform where DOSD FNI featured the frequently asked questions on nutrigenomics. For the second time, DOSD FNI brings you Omexena with a bolder move to bring together omics experts from way beyond the Philippine borders. The Philippines continues to be to build strong innovative foundations and learning and reflecting from the global scene is a very way to go. As such, we are thrilled to bring you the nine day Omexena lecture series. For nine afternoons, we are expecting to learn the best of omics technologies and how these emerging platforms can enhance nutrition and food research that will eventually be translated for societal benefits of our country. Beyond basics, hopes are high that we can also build networks and collaborative paths all towards building an omic-driven, innovative Philippines. Uh, William Wordsworth said that life is divided into three terms, that which was, which is, and which will be. So let us learn from the past to, the, to profit by the present and from the present to live better in the future. I hope that through all the topics to be discussed from this day until October 7, we can learn how to create a better future in life and nutrition through the studies of omic sciences. To all the participants, again, my warmest welcome and lend us your active participation because we have inspiring lecture series ahead. So thank you so much and stay tuned. Maraming maraming salamat po at magandang araw muli. Magandang agam po sa ating lahat. Omic Sena was coined by DOSDF and RI to create a scene in a good way. It seems that it will continue to serve as a platform for the DOSCF and RI to keep us in the loop on its undertaking in genomics. With Dr. Brian Gonzalez on board, the second Omic Sena for 2021 collaborates with the DOSC's Balik Scientist Program to drumbeat the advent of another set of omic science at the Institute, the Metabolomics. This expansion in the R&D platform will guide DOSCF and RI in setting up more actionable strategies in the molecular food and nutrition arena. I am optimistic that the series will provide new learnings to bring stronger and bolder omics-based research and development initiatives, not only in DOS 7 or I, but in the entire country, as I understand that this omics Sena is well represented by genomics enthusiasts, Mula Luzon, Visayas, at Mindanao. As we come together for the next nine afternoons, I hope that we will be able to lay out plans and strategies towards the creation of new intervention systems, biomarker discovery, and innovative health and nutrition platforms through the use of omics technologies. May this event sharpen our vision to acquire the lens of seeing through what our country needs to reach zero hunger, and optimum health and nutrition at the molecular level. Congratulations to the organizing committee of the Omic Sena Lecture Series and to all the staff of DOSDF and RI, led by Dr. Imelda Angeles Agdepa. Magandang agham sa ating lahat. A pleasant day to all. The Nutritional Genomics Program of the DOST Food and Nutrition Research Institute is part of the DOST's Big 21 in 2021. This achievement highlights the growing field of nutritional genomics and the DOST FNRI's new gen laboratory, now an ISO 
17025 Certified Molecular Laboratory. Beyond this recognition, I am more thrilled to see what our R&D program and uh, scientific and technological services in nutritional genomics can offer to ensure optimum nutrition for everyone. Earlier this year, the first Omic Sena answered frequently asked questions on nutrigenomics. The first installment of this web-based learning platform of DOST FNRI's genomics programs made us realize that nutritional genomics can scale up nutrition and health sciences. Studying our genes through the omics platforms can bring about enhanced nutrition recommendations and perhaps nutrition and health policies in the long run. Its eventual integration in clinical practice can boost our efforts to overcome malnutrition and help us achieve our goals of good health and well-being. As DOST continues to expand the country's omics footprint, this second offering of omics Sena with Dr. Brian Gonzalez, our Balik Scientist for Metabolomics, is anticipated to bring new frontiers in omics-based innovations. This will fine-tune our efforts to use various molecular platforms to pacify and eventually end our long-standing battle against malnutrition and non-communicable diseases. Now, with the generous sharing of information and practices from our keynote speakers ahead of us, I invite you all to join me in getting a detailed glance at omics technologies and how they can play critical roles in nutrition and health. May this deep appreciation of omics technologies guide us in pushing for more innovations directed to our local needs. I am optimistic that this lecture series will also strengthen the competencies of our researchers in initiating omics-based research and development. One thing that the ongoing pandemic has taught us is to hold tight to what science and technology can do. Science and technology will always be an important key in solving various societal problems. Napaghahandaan man o hindi, katulad nitong pandemia, innovations and discoveries will help us thrive and become resilient. On behalf of the Department of Science and Technology, I would like to thank our speakers from different parts of the European Union and the United Kingdom for their time and expertise. I extend my appreciation especially to our DOST Balik Scientist, Dr. Gerard Brian L. Gonzalez, for bringing this exciting series to light, together with the DOST Food and Nutrition Research Institute. Thank you all for being here. Let us have a learning field week ahead. Mabuhay! In 2010, DOSD FNRI revolutionized its take on nutrition by incorporating genomics in its researches, investigating the relationship of anthropometric, biochemical, clinical, dietary, and health components to the genetic makeup of Filipinos. DOSD FNRI is looking into providing a more personalized approach of achieving optimum nutrition to every Filipino. Through nutritional genomics, we attempt to better understand how a single nucleotide, a single letter, can make a big difference in our way of living. And so, to support this endeavor, DOSD FNRI capitalized on establishing its molecular laboratory known as the Nutritional Genomics or the New Gen Lab. With its thrust of bringing science for the people, 
The new Gen Lab provides assessment of genes and genetic variants associated with micronutrient deficiencies and diet-related non-communicable diseases. The new Gen Lab is equipped with some of the state-of-the-art equipment in molecular biology, such as the automated nucleic acid extraction machine, bioinformatics, real-time and digital PCR systems, automated liquid handling system, micro-volume spectrophotometer system, and gel documentation system. With a complete workflow adhering to the highest standard of competency in laboratory testing, Nugen Lab is setting the mark in providing mole biotechniques with transparency, validity, and reliability. Whether you are an individual or a group of enthusiasts seeking answers in nutritional genomics, the new Gen Lab awaits you. Our proficient personal works in close contact with our customers through customized analysis, provision of technical consultancy in nutritional genomics, and standardization or laboratory competency. To even serve you better, we are partnering with a leader in genomic testing for a higher throughput and faster turnaround time. Welcome to the new generation of nutrition. Welcome to the new Gen Lab. Day two of nine, welcome to the second episode of Omixena Lecture Series. My name is Jay Kusnasis and I will be your all-around virtual assistant this afternoon. Good afternoon here in the Philippines and good morning in Denmark and the Netherlands. Before I turn over the floor to our DOST Balik Scientist for Metabolomics, Dr. Gerard Brian Gonzalez, please allow me to highlight that the Omixena Lecture Series is part of the countdown to DOST FNRI's 75th anniversary, 88 days before the holidays and 276 days before FNRI's anniversary on July 1, 2022. For 75 years, ang DOST FNRI ay kasama ninyo sa bawat yung to ng buhay at kabuhayan. 
please watch out for more events as we near our 75th anniversary. Now, for the send heading of our second Omic Sene episode, I would like to give the floor now to our DOST Balik Scientist for Metabolomics, Dr. Gerard Brian Gonzalez. Kumusta, Brian? Thank you very much, Jacus. Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat dyan sa Pilipinas. And good morning from here in the Netherlands and in Denmark. Uh, we are now day two of our uh, Omic Sena webinar series. And we have a special treat for you today. Uh, with us is Professor Lars Drogsted from University of Copenhagen, uh, who will be giving us a lecture um, about dietary biomarkers. Um, but before that, I'd like to introduce him formally. Uh, Professor Lars is a professor of biomedicine and nutrigenomics at the University of Copenhagen, and has worked both at the public and private research organizations with a main focus on bioactive food components, chronic disease prevention, and biomarker development. His group is at the forefront of research in metabolomics and has contributed to a range of human intervention studies to predict metabolic changes and disease development. Recently, he's also very much involved in the gut uh, microbiota metabolic communication, and he is the uh, head of the Preventive and Clinical Nutrition Group at the Department of Nutrition, Exercise, and Sports at the University of Copenhagen. He has co-authored hundreds of papers, books, and he has an H index higher than my dreams in life. So without further ado, mga kaibigan, ikinalulugod kong ipakilala sa inyo, Professor Lars Drakstad. Lars, take it away. Thank you very much. I'll, uh, for the kind words, I'll start by sharing my screen if I can. Um, there we go. Is he allowed? Okay. I think so, we, we already gave the permission for you to share the slides, Lars. Good. Yeah, I think it should be there now. Uh, you can't see it yet. You can see it? No, we cannot. No, you cannot see it. Not yet. Yes, not yet. That's kind of odd. Um, yeah. It says, I have a share here, I share my screen. Well, in the meantime, welcome yeah. to the over 200 participants there in this go. webinar. We have 205 participants so far from all over the Philippines. So I think yeah, we see your screen now, Lars. All right. That's good. Okay. Thank you. The floor is yours. Well, what was wrong before? Anyway, uh, thank you very much for the kind words and thank you for inviting me to uh, give an overview of uh, sampling, storing, and investigating dietary biomarkers. And uh, this is an outline of what I'm going to say, something about the biomarker concepts and, and definitions. Uh, what, uh, how do you classify biomarkers? And how do you assess food intake? Not the traditional way, but by thinking of uh, finding biomarkers by metabolomics. Then I'll say something about um, biomarkers of, uh, of food intake uh, and uh, biomarker validation, and also the metabolic interplay of um, the food intakes and health. So in, in the last part there, I'm gonna give a few examples in, on microbiota, how that affects our, um, the way we metabolize our diet and how we can look at the whole diet using metabolomics. So one of the starting points um, that I'm going to tell about was a big project uh, uh, with uh, many countries in the EU, but also Canada, uh, called Foodball Food Biomarkers Alliance, where we started out sharing the work between us uh, rather than competing for ones and signs. And, uh, we, uh, in, and as part of that, we uh, uh, developed the um, uh, definition of uh, biomarkers uh, that has currently uh, very many definitions in, in literature. So uh, we uh, went on uh, and tried to make a very simple um, model of, um, of biomarker classification, saying, well, we are exposed, of course, to something, or we take, uh, we eat our diet, uh, and we, uh, this may have an effect on the system. But depending on us, who we are, our health, our susceptibility, our resilience, this uh, will modify the uh, relationship between exposure 
and the effect in the system, which is our body. I mean, this model is very general, could be used in environmental science, can be used in, in human health science and in nutrition. So uh, of course, since we are intelligent uh, beings, we also feedback. So uh, if there is a certain effect in the system, <clears throat> we get less healthy, for instance, we might change our way of doing and thereby change our exposures. So of course, as humans, uh, and when we study humans, we have to look into this as well, uh, that we're actually able to affect the system. So here's another way of looking at this. So the exposure can be many different things, uh, not only diet, but also biological, physiological, psychological, chemical, social, cognitive, physical, and biochemical exposures or environments that we uh, experience in our, um, in our society and our lives. And our health and susceptibility is of course different from individual to individual and our ability to withstand these pressures are different. And of course, every day throughout life, these pressures and our uh, withstanding of it goes back and forth. And it's actually more complex than this because by being challenged, we're actually also uh, getting healthier unless the challenge is too hard to overcome. So of course, I mean, running is, uh, is uh, devastating to the muscles. Look, if you look at them right after, uh, but in the long term, running is of course healthy uh, because it gives us a challenge so that we build our muscles. The same way, way with the, uh, with the uh, uh, nutrition and the nutrition challenges. So uh, if we get the right challenges as an individual, we are likely to get more healthy uh, by, um, um, based on this model and also from the experience in science. So this means that we have three major classes of biomarkers, the exposure, the effect, and the health or susceptibility biomarkers. And based on this, you can subdivide, of course, much more. And uh, we have this um, overview where you have, for instance, exposure or intake biomarkers up here. They can be related to nutrients or to non-nutrients intakes, uh, whole foods or dietary patterns. So you can have many different biomarkers or uh, combinations of biomarkers that you will uh, see and, uh, and uh, uh, that you are able to, um, to find and uh, explore uh, scientifically. Then I'll not go very much into effect biomarkers uh, uh, or the susceptibility biomarkers, but just uh, underline that it's not a certain assay that is either exposure, susceptibility, or effect. It's actually the way the scientist is using the methodology. So if you measure glucose, it could be in the blood, for instance, then that could be a marker of recent intake of a sugar beverage. Uh, or other foods that contain sugars. But if you measure it uh, as a, um, uh, in, in, in the uh, early morning after uh, an overnight fast, it will uh, tell about your, uh, your uh, susceptibility because if you are still high in glucose in the morning, then you are uh, maybe pre-diabetic or uh, at a higher metabolic risk. And if you change the diet of uh, having uh, seen this, uh, then when you follow your glucose again, then you will see the change and that will be um, based on your exposure. So now you're using it as, or uh, sorry, as an effect. And now you're using the same measurement as an effect biomarker. So clearly it's not the assay. It's not the way you measure, but it's, it is the way you use the data that determines a biomarker. So this is one of the concepts that is very important in the biomarker area. So yeah, I already mentioned the food and food component biomarkers. And then also, for instance, many of the things we measure in nutrition is the, the nutrient status biomarkers. So that is actually in the area. Of course, it's close to exposure, but it's also close to susceptibility. If you are deficient in a certain vitamin or mineral, uh, then your status is not good and your risk of disease is larger. So your resilience is not as good. So why do we want biomarkers for food intake assessment? And uh, clearly we want to know, in order to do nutrition science, we want to know what people are eating. So the current state of dietary assessment is to use one of the dietary instruments 
uh, that we are generally using in most nutrition science at this time. So they can be dietary history, food frequency, uh, frequency questionnaires, uh, weighed dietary records, or 24 hour, uh, four hour records, just to mention some. They are quite time consuming. They also are subjective. They're based on memory and food composition tables that may vary uh, with season and region and other things. And they also focused on specific foods and nutrients. They are focused uh, usually on specific populations. So for instance, the European food composition tables would not work in the Philippines. So therefore uh, you need to have these things uh, for, for every country. I'm not saying that, um, that biomarkers will make uh, this uh, just much more easy, but it has, they have some other uh, abilities. For instance, uh, we don't have necessarily the same systematic and random errors that you have from the dietary instruments. So biomarkers in the football consortium, we started out defining a range of food groups. I mean, there are many definitions of food groups. Here are some of them uh, that are one uh, subdivision. And uh, we thought that at least if we could start finding biomarkers from each group of uh, foods, that would be very helpful. But very soon we of course realized, uh, or we knew in advance that these foods within the fruit and vegetable groups or within the food of animal origin group, they are very different. So if we think of the whole food, the diet, uh, then you may have a diet looking something like that. Diet pyramids are very popular with uh, here with a lot of uh, fruits and vegetables uh, at the bottom, uh, some bread, and then much less uh, food of animal origin at the top. Um, and these, I mean, show all the different foods and food groups. However, in a single meal, you also mix all these things. So if you take a sample at a certain time after a meal, you may not see the whole diet, you may see the recent meal. So that's of course uh, important. And if we look at the, uh, the this is a, a very Danish uh, dish, it's rye bread with herring on top and raw onion. That's uh, probably not what you eat a lot in the Philippines, but that's a very common uh, thing to eat for lunch here. Uh, then this consists of a range of foods all these foods that I just mentioned. So we have the bread that consists of course of, 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 uh, uh, of um, uh, sorry, huh? of starch. Uh, there is maybe some hordenine in it or other uh, um, um, rye or barley uh, uh, components. There's maltose, then there is salt and there is uh, yeast. And then we have uh, also the carbohydrate, the lipid, the uh, protein. So we can divide it in traditional uh, nutrition terms and we can go on to the chemistry and say the lipid is not just lipid, maybe it's triglyceride with a specific uh, lipid chain sitting in it, or it's a linoleic acid, beta citrusterol ester or something else. So we want to go down to this very fine grained knowledge and understanding of, uh, of the composition. Uh, and uh, metabolomics is one of the areas that gives us this opportunity. So, Again, back to the food groups and, and subgroups, uh, we can see uh, that uh, meats or the food of animal origin, for instance, are very, very different foods. Uh, we have all the dairy products, we have eggs, we have uh, um, also the, the different uh, meats, and they can be red terrestrial meat, white terrestrial meat, fish, and, uh, and offal meat even. So a lot of different uh, kinds of meat and they are not the same. Even different fish from different areas are not the same. We can see that by metabolomics. So therefore we have a huge challenge in front of us if we want to change our ways to go from the current instruments to biomarkers. It will be a, a, a large international effort to do that. However, uh, it will give, uh, I think very much sense and I also think the two methodologies, the current methodologies and the new methodology is they will actually have things that go hand in hand and will, uh, they will actually supplement each other. So we'll have an even better nutritional assessment of uh, individual and group diets. So what do we know about food consumption? I mean, what do we want to know about food consumption? Is it the, the recent intake of, of a, a, a certain food? Um, or is it the average consumption of 
each and every food. Maybe it's a class signature uh, of a diet, so it's a nutritiping uh, that we want to do. So are you eating diet A, B, C, D, or E uh, is uh, also a typical way. So we have very many questions in uh, nutrition science that we want to use biomarkers for. And it may not be the same biomarkers. Uh, it may depend on the question that you raise. So um, do we want to see uh, the class signature at group level or individual level? Uh, do we want to uh, have it as a qualitative? Did this person eat the, um, the uh, banana or did this person not eat the banana? Or is it qualitative? How much banana did you eat? Uh, the quantitative one. So I think we can find and apply biomarkers uh, for all of these purposes, uh, but it depends also very much on study design. You see here, for instance, um, uh, one of my former PhD students eating, you would think maybe it was spaghetti, but it's actually cabbage here being eaten raw, and she's not very happy with it. Uh, but to find the cabbage biomarkers, we had to have a lot of people eating this. Uh, here's a supermarket that was set up for a supermarket study, so we could um, uh, people could come and get their food for free, but when they left, we would register everything they took, and this way we see their whole diet. So that's just to show two different ways of doing interventions and two different questions. So, of course, uh, many of you are, are uh, in nutrition science, you know this very well, but just to recapitulate the basic study designs in nutrition and health, the, the uh, um, borrowed from medical science, the most important is the, the randomized control trial, uh, where you can uh, control exactly and you can, can um, uh, randomize people to different groups, diet uh, or food A or food B or diet A or diet B. They can be even a meal study, very short. Um, you can have them as crossover or parallel. Very often, if you can do crossover, that means the same person goes through all the diets and uh, have them over time. Uh, that is very useful. But if it's a long-term intervention over several years, then crossover is usually not possible. So you can also do observational studies. And that can be a very good design in many ways. Uh, very often, actually, uh, the cross-sectional studies that are usually not seen as very strong in evidence can be very good for uh, validating biomarkers, and I'll come back to that. Also, case control studies are very uh, useful uh, for, for, for both finding and, and validating biomarkers. And long-term cohort studies, of course, are uh, useful when we want to apply the biomarkers and see the effects on health. So that's very useful. Um, Metabolomics can also be, uh, or nutritional metabolomics can also be used in, in uh, uh, both uh, in experimental studies. You can look at single nutrients or, or foods, um, uh, extracts or something else in cell, uh, cell cultures. You can look at transgenic models or you can do feeding studies of short or long duration in different animal species uh, in order to figure out specific mechanisms uh, and, uh, and do experiments that may be too invasive for humans. So all these different designs that we know from nutrition science and from medical science, they all, they're all open for metabolomics, but there are certain things you should know. And, and I mean, analyzing a sample for, uh, that has not, where metabolomics was not thought of from the beginning can sometimes be demanding because you don't have the necessary controls. You need, very often, it's very nice to have repeated sampling, to have samples from everyone on a maybe on a standardized diet or before they start in order to be able uh, to know the individual difference because the individual differences in our metabolomes are much larger than the effect that we can have from a single food or from a diet. It takes much longer time to move it. So therefore, there are a lot of things that are important to know when you try to go for designing a metabolomics uh, study. So. I think uh, also um, uh, all of these are open for exploratory research. So finding the new hypotheses before we start testing them uh, is uh, one uh, area where the omic sciences are, are particularly strong, uh, but they also uh, lead us to the tools so developing the tools like biomarkers that we need for our hypothesis driven research. So to the metabolomes that I'm not supposed to talk a lot about, uh, and you may have seen this slide before, I'm not sure, 
uh, is from a, um, a food biomarker review that uh, um, uh, several uh, researchers in the area wrote together uh, back in, in 2014. And we uh, look at all the, uh, the full exposome, uh, looking at the exposure from, from diet, from, uh, which contains, of course, the food as such, the additives, contaminants, a lot of different and other exposures like uh, um, pollution and uh, medicine. Uh, and then you have, of course, also your endogenous metabolome. So the food metabolome is just one of many metabolomes. And you may even say that when you eat a food, you eat another metabolome and then you integrate it, metabolize it, and then uh, it, it changes. So how do we measure this? Well, it depends on the sample and on the design, as I already said. So you can use all kinds of samples. I mean, metabolomics is open uh, for everything as long as you can extract it. There are even metabolomic uh, uh, methods where you can use solid samples, but in general, you would use uh, liquid samples or, or gas phase samples in order to do metabolomics. So you can do that on, uh, uh, on serum, uh, urine, uh, stool, tissue, etc. So it's very open in this way. And uh, just very shortly, the, the, the pipeline uh, is that uh, you have a research question that you want to open or explore and uh, you have um, multiple study uh, platforms. You have to think of the study design and think of which is best to answer your question, of course. Then the sampling and storage. And I'll say in general, um, metabolomics is very uh, resilient. If you cool your samples quickly and you store them at a very low temperature, they are usually very, uh, uh, you, can, you can check them up and there is very little change to them. So it depends, of course, if you have a very uh, sensitive metabolite, it may be different, but most endogenous metabolites, they survive pretty well. So uh, you can store them and you can have a biobank and you can go back to that biobank and reanalyze your samples later on for a different purpose. Uh, so then you have the whole analytical pipeline, um, the analysis and the sample workup, uh, the data pre-processing and data analysis, which are, um, um, usually uh, chemistry and, and uh, data uh, science oriented. And then comes the, uh, the um, uh, sorry, the biomarker identification and the interpretation of results. And I'll tell you that the biomarker identification, if you don't have, um, if you don't know all the biomarkers in advance, that usually we don't, then there are a lot of new compounds and identifying them is usually the most uh, time consuming of this whole process. So if we look at a simple meal study design, so finding biomarkers with metabolomics, you can have some kind of food that you want to give. I just gave five examples here. And you take a, uh, the food, you take a sample before. So you have your reference sample, and then you give the food and you may uh, sample up to uh, 24 hours at intervals. And you also may have blood collection at several intervals. Uh, this, kind of, of uh, uh, gives you a, po a possibility of uh, looking at all the data that come out here and you can integrate them and figure out what is common to many of these. And you can start doing also the time course analysis, which is really important for finding a biomarker. We would expect something that is related to the food. If it's, uh, uh, if it's a meal study and it's a short-term biomarker, you would expe expect it to increase in concentration and then maybe uh, stay there or go down at 24 hours. So we have this opportunity. So we have the sampling, the sample preparation and uh, the list of features. And what we see then, and this is why I took this slide in, uh, is that we may see a plasma level changing like this, uh, indicating that this is related to the exposure. And this is the beauty of metabolomics that you can see these things both for uh, things that are related to the exposure, then they would usually start at zero. Uh, or uh, effect, then they would usually start at some point and then go either up or down, with meaning that this endogenous metabolite is changing in its level. And then you try to identify the most important metabolites and what they are chemically. So here's a simple uh, example of this, um, uh, giving uh, uh, orange juice, and uh, one of the most famous biomarkers in, in the whole area is uh, proline betaine from, from citrus. And you'd see here that it goes up 
uh, abruptly and it's almost down again at 24 hours. So it increases uh, quickly and then you excrete it with uh, an excretion half-life of uh, a few hours. Uh, you can also see that it was not zero at time, zero. So the biomarker is not uh, only there for a citrus juice. It must be there for from other things as well. And in fact, there are low levels of this compound in many fruits and vegetables. However, the level in citrus juice is so much higher that you can still use it as a biomarker for citrus. But if we look in, this is from an observational study, a cross-sectional study, and we ask people how much fruit they eat. And of course, when they, people eat fruit, they're very likely also to eat oranges or drink orange juice. So we see a very, very strong uh, correlation between the total fruit intake and proline betaine. So now it suddenly becomes a marker of a certain dietary habit, although it's a specific marker uh, or relatively specific marker for, uh, for citrus. So the way you ask the question will also uh, provide you the, with the, the answers related to your question. Now, as I already said, these uh, curves of, uh, of biomarkers after a food intake, here's from an onion study, where we uh, found a range of different markers, don't remember how many, between 20 and 30 compounds. And some of them are very quickly excreted. Some of them were hardly excreted uh, or changing their levels in 24 hours, which means that, of course, if you want to use this biomarker, you have to sample quickly after the food was ingested. If you want to, uh, to have something that is there for a longer time, this biomarker may be much better because uh, it will stay around in the blood for several days before it uh, starts declining. So therefore you have a chance of, of finding biomarkers of uh, recent food intake and biomarkers of more uh, longer term or within maybe uh, days or weeks of uh, a food intake. So this is an important concept. So the food consumption intervals can be rarely, intermittently or frequently. And depending on uh, if you only eat it rarely, then you'll have to sample very often uh, in order to find a marker like this. Uh, but um, this one will be easy to find also if you are eating the food only intermittently or, uh, or frequently. So this uh, tells you a lot, uh, but if, uh, and will give you uh, possibilities, not only to look at uh, the selection of biomarkers that you want to use for your study, but also you might use several biomarkers in order to figure out the, uh, the time uh, course uh, since the last meal. A very important thing for a biomarker is, is not just finding them, but also to validate them. And uh, in the football consortium, we, we, we uh, did a literature search. What do people mean by validation? And uh, looking into that, they mean a lot of different things. At least eight different things are called validation in the literature. So we set up a validation scheme saying, well, okay, then you need to do all these eight in order to have a valid biomarker. I would say that not all eight are always relevant. So you of course have to still uh, think about it, which ones you would use, uh, but these are the general ones. And we wrote a paper about it where that you can um, consult if you wish. So of course it has to be plausible. I mean, it's not plausible that something from meat is a marker of, of, uh, of um, a citrus. So therefore it has to be a citrus uh, compound that could derive from there. The dose response kinetics uh, should be there. The time response kinetics, as I just showed you, it must be robust. So if you eat a lot of other things, it should not affect your biomarker. It should be strong enough. It should be uh, reliable uh, in terms of, of uh, comparison with other biomarkers for the same food. It should be stable so you can uh, store it and, and uh, take up your samples later on. Uh, the analytical performance, and that's a whole group of criteria by itself, uh, has to be good, so it has to be sensitive, specific, and so on. Uh, and uh, it should be measurable in different labs independently, so it should be reproducible. So this is the whole uh, area there. So divide, uh, developing a biomarker here for banana, you start out maybe with a meal study and you find some of the biomarkers, then you have to validate. Typically, a cross-sectional study is very good for this uh, purpose because it shows robustness of the marker and it shows dose response often because people are re reporting different levels of intake. And then you often have to do additional studies to be sure. Uh, and then you may have fully uh, uh, by, uh, validated biomarker and reach the finishing point 
of this game. Uh, so um, um, how many, how far are we? Uh, I, we are working, I think, with somewhere 30 to 50 different foods, maybe even more now. Uh, someone mentioned 100 at the meeting I was uh, last night. So uh, I think uh, it could be very many. Here are some examples of, of, uh, of uh, components. And uh, my judgment of how far we are, some of them are kind of still great. They're not fully robust, for instance, DHA and EPA. Um, I have samples from, um, from people who are eating fish in the South Pacific, and they don't seem to have these uh, always. So in certain areas, the fish seem to contain omega-6 um, you know, uh, fatty acids rather than omega-3 fatty acids. So they're not always, you cannot use them for all uh, purposes, but also, I mean, people eat them as, uh, as uh, additions to their diet, and therefore you can, they're not necessarily robust. So you have these um, problems all the time that you have to think about and uh, think carefully about the validation and the selection of your biomarker. I'll go through all these now. Uh, there are also others for uh, uh, whole grain, rye and wheat, some legumes, oils, smoked meat. There are many biomarkers uh, coming up and all the time new studies showing this. For banana, for instance, we found 33 metabolites of banana consumption. However, none of them are really specific. A lot of them actually at the same time endogenous metabolites. So what do we do in this case? Well, uh, one of the things is that we select some uh, that uh, represent uh, banana, but and then we start combining them. So we took some of the best uh, compounds and we started uh, meta um, combining them. So dopamine sulfate is clearly a human metabolite that comes from our synapses uh, in the nervous system, but banana contains so much uh, of, uh, of the precursors that we, um, we actually increase our levels very much. Same for salsolinol. Um, and other compounds here, mebolonic acid even. But if we combine these and we start doing uh, maths on that, in a cross-sectional study, in this case, it was a Carmen study from Germany, we found an area under the curve of uh, almost 0.9, which means that we can uh, reproduce uh, the 24-hour recall almost exactly uh, using this, bio, this combination biomarker. So what people, when people say they eat banana, even a small amount of banana, we could uh, catch it. Maybe the very lowest level we didn't find. So, but there also may be 10% who said that they were eating or didn't say that they were eating banana. So that may be the, the subjective element. So when we compare uh, a biomarker with uh, something else here, a, a dietary instrument, which is subjective, then it doesn't become better than the instrument that we compare with, of course. So you can also have the study design and you can look at the number of markers. So uh, if you have an animal study, which is extremely controlled, you may find oh, more than 300 features from uh, giving them, feeding them a little apple. Uh, however, if you, uh, uh, and, and here are some of the compounds, you can see that some of them are just endogenous uh, amino acids like leucine. Uh, there are uh, hormones like corticosterone and there are lipids that uh, change. So apple has, um, a lot of effects, uh, but many of these must be, of course, effect markers because they are endogenous metabolites. Then uh, we make a human study. We find more than 40 features, and we can see uh, apple eating and non-apple eating. And we can see here's one who seems to not have been eating uh, his or her apples. However, it turns out that when we look at each person before and after, then we see different metabolites. So people move. Most of them move in this direction. These are the females in the study. Uh, and this person happened to start in another point and therefore actually moved, but not uh, far enough to be in the area in this PCA of the, um, of the uh, apple, but still compliant for sure. Um, the males had a slightly different direction. Uh, so maybe some difference in, in the way uh, we uh, metabolize apple, uh, which uh, is, of course, interesting. Uh, if we look at um, the uh, observational study, here's a prospective study where we also looked into this. We found somewhere between four and 20 features being changed. And now uh, one of the few that was changed in all the different designs was 3-indole propionic acid, which is a uh, metabolite uh, from the microbiota. So this is a microbiota indicating that apple has an effect 
on the microbiota and affects our metabolism through the microbiota. Uh, in this case, the metabolism of tryptophan. So the gut microbiota is, is very important, as I already uh, mentioned, for, for uh, our metabolism. And uh, what we eat uh, and the time since we eat uh, means uh, changes in what the gut microbiota do. Uh, shortly after a uh, meal, there will be uh, enough uh, um, starches and sugars. So we have sacrolytic metabolism. And then uh, with time, uh, 12 hours after maybe or more, we have proteolytic uh, metabolism uh, instead because uh, the, uh, there are no more carbs and uh, then the bacteria go to start eating something else. Uh, a lot of different compounds form and some of these are metabolized into compounds that are then signaling compounds that signal from our uh, gut to the brain, to the kidney, to other places and therefore have a major importance on health. Some of them are uh, deleterious to health, like uh, trimethylamine that's then further metabolized into trimethylamine oxide. That seems to be an independent risk factor of cardiovascular disease, although it's a compound that comes from fish, uh, but it also comes from meat. If you have a generally very um, uh, poor diet, then uh, you will form more, more of it, and it may also be part of your genetic um, um, constitution of uh, uh, how you are, um, your genetic build up, uh, whether you form it or not. So the um, Unina intervention was one that uh, we did in a consortium together with uh, the Italian group in, in Napoli. And uh, here they were given uh, uh, their um, control diet. They were, uh, they were overweight people and they were not eating a very good diet. Uh, or we made an intervention to, to uh, give them Mediterranean diet. So we looked into that. And there were a lot of changes by metabolomics. One of them that we looked into uh, was uh, because we gave them uh, walnuts as part of the, the Mediterranean diet. So we know of, of all the different places where you find the uh, they, This came from the walnuts. And in the fecal samples, we could see that uh, both at four and eight weeks, there was a strong increase in uh, some of these uh, urolithins that are metabolites of, uh, of elagitanins and very late coming metabolites. We could also see them in urine. Uh, so you could sample different places, but uh, you, the uh, stool samples and the urine tell slightly different things. This is probably more long-term, this is more short-term. So the correlation is there, but it's not extremely strong. So again, this is probably part of physiology. We shouldn't expect something that goes extremely linear because we are looking at two different questions. We also did uh, uh, quite a lot of study in the area where I live, far north in, in Europe. Uh, so um, comparing uh, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, and uh, also Norway in some of the studies. In this one, uh, we uh, looked at um, um, a, a regional diet. So Mediterranean diet, I mean, is maybe not good in all areas of the world. For instance, in, in my country, people will never eat a Mediterranean diet. It's too foreign to them. So it's better to design a healthy diet based on uh, the local uh, foods, also for su sustainability reasons, and, uh, and build it from there. And there, uh, therefore, people can recall or, or, or can recognize the, the uh, foods and better accept them. So it's more possible to make a very healthy food based on your local produce. But the food cultures in these northern countries are still different. So eating uh, fish is not the same because in Finland, they catch them in, in, in freshwater lakes. In Iceland, they catch them in deep sea, uh, Atlantic, northern Atlantic. So they will be different and we'll see differences in the biomarkers based on region. So here was a study where we had uh, slightly overweight people and they were given either a healthy Nordic diet designed to be healthy from mainly local products uh, and a controlled diet. And uh, we could discriminate between these two diets easily <clears throat> by uh, metabolomics. So uh, we, we get this um, uh, classification performance. And <clears throat> when we look at it further on, we start seeing that uh, on the uh, control diet, the, we don't see a lot of biomarkers because that's a very white market uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, white bread and, uh, and fats. Uh, you don't see a lot. Uh, but if you uh, give whole grain or you give fish or give berries that we eat a lot in, in the northern countries, you see a range of biomarkers that come up from that and also some effect markers that are related uh, to this uh, dietary exposure. So we can start looking at 
the relationship between these different foods and the health outcomes. So I think um, yeah, this is the, the healthy Nordic diet, but also we had a, a direction where some were eating more fish and some were eating more whole grain because this differs a bit between the countries. So conclusion and some funding. Um, I think by accurately classifying, validating and combining uh, biomarkers, it's possible to classify the recent intake of several foods and drinks correctly. So then you may have to sample often to get that or pool samples from multiple samplings. You can identify misreporting in short-term dietary assessment. And we've done that multiple times in our studies. And you can identify a range of food to dietary intake related biomarkers that uh, are affected by the microbiome and by dietary change. And I want to thank support from the, the uh, joint program initiative that funded the, the food bowl project, but also EU grants on, uh, on study called Preview, um, Nordic Council of Ministers for the, uh, funding the Nordic studies and uh, Carlsberg Foundation uh, for um, a personal grant to me to develop the biomarker area. So thank you for your attention. Wonderful presentation. Thank you very much, Lars. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, we opened the floor for questions, but before that, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry, puberty is hitting in. Um, before that, of course, I'd like to uh, offer, we, we could all offer Lars our virtual round of applause. Thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. We do have questions in the chat box and Jacobs will be reading the questions from our YouTube feed. Um, oh yeah. So, but, so far, let's start uh, with- There's yeah? no question on YouTube yet, so. All right, so if you well, have burning questions, please raise them, I think we have uh, time for a few questions. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a question about how do you take into account the effect of medication and food supplements in your, in your samples? Well, I mean, we, we, the only thing is to find the biomarkers of, the, of these. So uh, I didn't show here, but I mean, we, uh, all the most common over-the-counter drugs like uh, ibuprofen or paracetamol, uh, we, we, we know the biomarkers that so we can see them. Also several other drugs so they can also be seen by metabolomics, but of course you have to develop the biomarkers or find in the literature, the known metabolites that should be excreted. Some of this is, is known and you can uh, take it into account. So if you want to do that, uh, just like you do in, 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 in other studies, if you say that people were supposed not to eat this and that, or they should not be on this particular drug, then if you find that that drug was actually, actually taken by some of your volunteers, you will have to exclude them because your protocol said that they were, this was not allowed. So it's also a way of, of uh, showing uh, or finding um, more fine-grained uh, compliance measures. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, and for uh, supplements, they are often different. I mean, if you eat, um, for instance, omega-3 fatty acid supplements, you'll see a range of omega-3 fatty acid metabolites, but you will not see all the other fish metabolites. So therefore, you don't see, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, some, um, we have, for instance, a, a range of, of arseno compounds that are often seen in, in fish, and we have uh, other fatty acids that do not exist in the, in the, um, in the supplements. That, that question, by the way, came from uh, Hiyas uh, Hunyo. She's a, a professor at the University of the Philippines Institute of Chemistry. So she has, she's running a, uh, a mass spec facility. Well, why don't you share, Lars, what mass specs you have in your lab? So, yeah, I have, um, well, I have three QSOFs uh, uh, that uh, are the working horses for this area. Um, and uh, they are also used mainly for the, uh, for the identification. So by, to do MSMS. Uh, and uh, then I have um, a, a triple quad for um, quantitative analysis, but Usually, actually, the, the QTOFs are very good for that as well. So um, most of the, uh, the uh, targeted analysis run there as well. Isn't it a, a Waters equipment you also have? Yeah, it's Waters. All of it is Waters that I have. But uh, it's not. Yeah. I mean, I would like to have others as well. But, uh, <laughs> but this uh, has been working fine for us. Well, just to highlight in the beginning, that, yes, I was I out think looking also, at yeah. many equipment. And, and then um, I, I went to all the, the, the different vendors. And I can recommend doing that because uh, there was only one who were able to analyze 
uh, overnight. Uh, uh, I think I, I asked them to to run 500 runs or something like that overnight of my samples, and uh, Waters could do that. And I actually didn't expect to buy Waters, but I ended up doing that because it seemed to be uh, robust enough. So that well, was I, I uh, asked, that's yeah. always a good way to do check them out. Yeah, I, I just asked to highlight that he has also has a Waters Premier, I think uh, you can yeah, that's one, verify that's that he has. Have, yeah. yeah, so just to say that, yeah, we can also do the research uh, yeah, that yeah. Uh, Lars was uh, mentioning a while ago. Um, oh, there no. is There are several questions about, uh, and, and this is also the same as the question I, ha I was asked yesterday about integrating the food dome and the, the biomarker of food intake ohm. Um, It, it, has there been, um, yeah, has there been efforts to actually do an entire food dome and because it's a, always a complete meal we eat and not just one banana? Well, I mean, the, 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 the foodomics is, is a, a bit confused because we often call what I just presented uh, uh, foodomics, but of course, you also have a foodomics that is the omics of the foods. So, I mean, uh, so. Whenever we do uh, uh, try to look for biomarkers of, uh, of a food, we also do uh, a screening of the food itself and extracts of the food, because that helps us to try and identify the compounds and show that it's a plausible market. If you find a completely new compound that we didn't know about in tomato, then, then of course, it's uh, nice to see that it was actually also then in, in the tomato itself or something that could plausibly be metabolized. I don't know if I answered your question really, but uh, but I mean it's otherwise if you talk about meal and there are several foods, then then you have to design your your meal in such yeah. a way that uh, it's not being uh, a compromise. But in general, I would recommend that you don't actually. I mean, it's good to to control the the the, the subjects, uh, maybe even give them a control diet in advance so that you have a standardized sample, but. If you want to find banana markers, it's really fine to have all kinds of other foods uh, in the background so that it's kind of mixed because then you will not have a lot of noise for other uh, similar foods that uh, you confuse the markers that are specific to banana. So therefore, it's it's a good idea actually uh, to, to not be uh, too um, clean in, in, uh, in, in your study. And we have noticed that in, in several studies that we actually Uh, uh, waste time uh, on mm -hmm. markets that are not really relevant. And in your studies, you mentioned a lot of biomarkers of like <clears throat> the Mediterranean diet, the healthy Nordic diet, and different fruits. There's a question here uh, uh, whether you've, you've also found biomarkers of processed food, highly processed food, because apparently Filipinos eat a lot of processed food. Yeah, we, we recently did. Uh, I mean, you have to def define the, 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 the processing. So uh, not in my group, but in uh, Augustine Scalbeas in, in, in the IAC uh, under WHO, they recently looked at, at uh, for instance, smoked and, uh, and cured meats and uh, found at least some markers of, of uh, smoked meat and of sausages, which are actually ended up being pepper biomarkers because that's the richest source of pepper in the diet. Um, but I've been looking at, for instance, uh, potatoes and, uh, and uh, um, boiled and fried and, uh, and uh, French fries. Uh, to try and see how how do they what do they look like? Also, something like coffee can be uh, produced in several ways, and both my lab and other labs have been looking at uh, the change in metabolome depending on which kind of coffee you are uh, using and how you brew your coffee. Yeah, I think what is meant here is really like you know hot dogs and and corned yeah, yeah. beef and canned meat. Uh, Yeah, um, but uh, I mean, the, 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 the poorer the diet, the more difficult it is to find the, the biomarker, biomarker. So I think uh, uh, that's uh, one of the area where we, areas where we need a very strong effort is to, to actually find the biomarkers of these foods that uh, don't really have any characteristics um, uh, except for, for meat. But we have meat biomarkers in general, so they would come up. Uh, and, uh, but uh, looking at, for instance, corned beef, Of course, there will be corn biomarkers in that as well. Uh, so it should be possible to see some of that uh, and, uh, and so on. So you have to design the study. And I think it's yeah. an important area uh, that needs further <laughs> development. And there's a technical question here. Um, 
uh, some clarification about when you say combining multiple biomarkers to yeah. to enhance you know enhance the predictability of a banana biomarker. What what did you mean by that? Well, it's actually uh, complicated. I uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you can combine them by saying, uh, for instance, three out of four of these should be visible. And when you combine them, uh, remember, you're not having a quantitative marker anymore. You have a qualitative. Did this person eat banana or not? Then uh, having defined who did and who didn't, then you can go on afterwards looking at how much using uh, another biomarker that is uh, uh, related to, to the intake level. So uh, for um, in many cases, we, we, make, we combine by having uh, a set that we are then asking whether they are there or not. And we set a limit saying that at least so and so many of the markets should be there. Yeah, and, and if the question was pertaining to the, the rock curves of a 0 0.9 uh, yeah. area under the curve, then um, yeah. I think on, when is it next week or, or towards the end of the week, we will have a, a workshop on data analysis on how to combine in a multivariate sure. analysis. So yeah, stay tuned for that. many ways to combine. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's uh, I mean, uh, for this lecture, I couldn't start going deep into that. Yes. Um, oh, she, she was cheering from Australia. So yeah, yeah. hi, hi, <laughs> how are you? Um, yeah, on a personal note, I, yeah, I, I'm just curious. You, one of the, one of the objectives of omic Sena in, in, in general, is that we have this understanding that the, maybe because of the different ethnic background in the Philippines, we may have a different response to foods. I was wondering if you've ever tried to have the same exact food that you gave to Danish people and we give it to, uh, let's say, Spanish people and see if they respond differently to exactly the same food. No, I don't have um, any ethnic studies at all. I also think the, 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 uh, uh, ethics committee here would be, I mean, really uh, frown. Uh, it's, it's, it would be difficult to do. Uh, but of course, if a study is done in several countries that like some of these are, uh, so we can compare, uh, uh, for instance, uh, there are, uh, here are some from, from Finland and some from Iceland. They will be slightly different, but of course, very much more similar, uh, I guess, than the uh, different uh, um, islands of, of uh, the Philippines. So um, we have this, and I don't know whether, yeah, oh, sorry, I have actually one study that I didn't, I, I pulled this slide out. We, uh, we, we, very early on, I had some Italian friends, uh, and uh, I asked them to go on a Danish diet, and then we looked at how many days did it take until they started looking Danish, uh, like, uh, and then we had some Danish couples doing the same. Uh, and uh, it, it took them like three days, then we couldn't discriminate whether they were Italians or Danish. So that should answer your question. Yeah. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> that's very, very interesting. interesting. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so it's, it's, yeah, I don't think it's genetics. Um, it could be the microbiota could be different, but uh, in general, it, it didn't take a long time. Do you have All anything, right. Jacobs? Well, I don't have any question from you two, but uh, actually I, I shared the same question with uh, Kevin Pan. Uh, he's asking if... How long be the uh, how long from ingestion of biomarker can be present in biological samples? Do you consider the time from which the subject had eaten the targeted food? Because my, my personal question actually is how long how long do these biomarkers stay in the circulation? But it depends on the biomarker. That was I, I tried to explain that with these kinetic curves. So mm -hmm. if you have something that has a very short half-life, then it's out uh, very quickly. Uh, and uh, if you have something with a longer half-life, like a, a more lipid-soluble compound, then it will stay around for a longer time. So you have to choose your biomarker for the purpose of your study. Okay. Well taken. Thank you, Lars. Okay, uh, another question, Brian, if you allow me. It's from uh, Yes as well. Um, Filipinos eat a lot more cooked food compared to other diets that are based on consuming raw fruits and vegetables. Have you looked into the effect of cooked versus uncooked diet nutrient metabolomics? Well, um, yeah, I mean, to some extent we have, uh, but I don't have a study, for instance, on co cooked vegetables versus raw vegetables. Uh, and it would be interesting to do. Uh, I think there is much more to do in, in the area of uh, food preparation. 
uh, we have so far we've been looking at the foods as such and not so much on the preparation. We we um, did a study together with uh, with um, um, a, a French group uh, on uh, fresh tomato, and we saw a range of biomarkers that do not coincide with the biomarkers that you see from tomato sauce uh, studies. So there is some indirect uh, evidence that there could be differences. Um, and then I looked in the differently cooked potatoes, so fried or boiled, but you don't eat potatoes raw. So therefore I, I cannot compare with the, with the raw uh, tuber. This is actually funny because in 2010, I moved from, yeah, I was living in, in Taguig and then uh, I moved to Copenhagen in 2010. And the first, yeah, first day of school there, you know, my Danish classmates were opening their lunch boxes and you see them eating raw cucumber and, and raw carrots. And I was like, yeah, this is so weird. <laughs> we never eat raw <laughs> things. Yeah, we eat a lot of raw, raw food here. That's true. It's, it's, it's uh, conceived as more healthy um, because it's, and oh, yeah. But um, I, I, well, I, different I think dietary, we still need yeah. good, uh, good nutrition science to prove that. All right, I think we have um, answered already. The questions, yeah. The questions. Yeah. There's a question about are metabolites and biomarkers synonymous? But I think the entire talk was about that. Uh, no, not well, I mean, I, but maybe I, I you can give your insight. It's not a bad it's... question. Uh, I think it's yeah, a relevant it question it's because not... I, yeah. I use them intermittently. But of course, everything is turned into metabolites, but not all the metabolites are good biomarkers. So I think it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a conceptual thing that you have to, to think of, of the metabolites as, as more or less everything, whereas the biomarkers are those that we can use for a certain purpose. Yeah. And when you study food, but like the banana biomarker, did you consider different varieties of banana? Uh, I mean, do, yeah. do you take that into account? Well, like, you which... have different varieties of banana in the Philippines, mm -hmm. I know. Yes, we do. But here, there is only one, the Cavendish. It's the only banana. I, I was going to say that. So, so <laughs> therefore, <laughs> this is the I only one say relevant. That. And, <laughs> but, yeah, and it doesn't uh, but taste it the same. To look at <laughs> I have to say all the red and short and thick and green varieties that you have in your beautiful kitchen. All right. I guess, uh, yeah, we can wrap up now. Uh, we, I, I'm very happy to announce that we are right on time. Um, unless there are more pressing questions. Look, I think there's one question we can enter. Uh, is there La one? one last question. This is from oh, Kaila yeah. Persega. Okay. Uh, this is well, this is actually uh, she's actually asking if uh, there are some findings in the recent studies of Lars that has been translated in healthcare. It's more on translational, perhaps. Like uh, uh, that, where this has been used for uh, for in healthcare area. I have a range of ongoing studies on that, but the the Nordic. Um, <laughs> Uh, study, we we uh, we uh, end up um, probably finding that the most important change in the diet uh, that was with the healthy Nordic diet was the change in the fat composition, which was opposite to what I thought. <laughs> so I kind of ended up seeing um, more effects related to the to the change in 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 uh, circulating lipids than I saw from markers of of uh, of uh, whole grain or or um, or. Uh, yeah, especially whole grain or, or berries, um, but they may be indirectly affected by the others, and that I don't know for sure. So it's it's a complex question uh, to answer. Um, but we have a range of studies more in the clinical area, for instance, where we want to look at cancer patients and at uh, people with with uh, other different conditions because they may have a very um, different metabolism, also pre-diabetics and diabetics. They may excrete compounds differently, so. I think they, it's also a very big area to, to explore. Right. Um, I think we, we, we have answered all the questions. Well, one last, I think that's very important. And, oh, and yeah. then let's wrap up. Uh, yeah, what, sure. The effect of the nutritional status. So mm. do you think obese yeah. people would metabolize differently than, than lean people, for example? Yeah, they do. Uh, yeah. Not all, but I mean, obesity, I mean, you can have healthy obese people, but uh, the, the risk that you are not healthy is much larger. And that is, seems to be related to a, a, 
a change in your microbiota and therefore the change in the signaling and and so on so if you if you do not eat the right food for the your microbiota then then it will uh, it will uh, uh, de uh, degenerate and uh, and that is probably part of all this yeah, i'm not saying that this is the re only reason for obesity but it's uh, it's one of the paths into metabolic disease for sure all right thank you very much lars um yeah i just want to say Many years ago, when I was starting my nutritional metabolomics journey, I also traveled to Copenhagen and I attended a course by Lars. It's a three-day course, isn't it, Lars? Uh, the yeah. Intro to Nutritional Metabolomics. Um, so if the Institute has some funding to send some people to his course, that would be that it's an amazing course. It's a very uh, hands-on course that Lars also gives. So uh, we're very fortunate that Lars was uh, generous enough to give us one day of a you know a very uh, yeah one hour of that very interesting course that he gives, um, yeah I, I pass it to Jacobs. Uh, do you have any uh, any remarks or anything from YouTube or? Yeah, we, I just uh, well, there's no question yet from YouTube. I I think uh, they were able to comprehend it uh, in a way that no one assists asking questions. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, so uh, may I just ask everyone to give a virtual apl uh, applause to Lars. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, on behalf of the DOST Food and Nutrition Research Institute, we can't thank you enough for, for spending your morning with us. Um, oh. As we say it here in the Philippines, uh, maraming salamat for joining us uh, and then giving us this wonderful lecture. Thank you very uh, much, I was very pleased. Thank you. Uh, by the way, uh, I understand that access to published literature may not be very, um, in, not all, uh, not all the literature that Lars uh, presented are accessible in the Philippines due to some paywall. So, um, yeah, I, I think we can organize uh, a shared Dropbox or something that we can give them all copies of the papers, Jacobs. Yeah, no problem. Actually, yeah, I, if you I, have I... some reading list for us, Lars. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I, um, the great. Well, the, the major papers on, on biomarkers and so on, they are open access. Open Amazing. Access. So they're, Amazing. They're published in yeah. uh, Genes and Nutrition. So the validation paper and the, the uh, um, classification paper, and also uh, several of the, the reviews on uh, biomarkers of different foods. I think there are 10 or 15 different such reviews on the food groups. Um, they are also there open access. So right. that's for that. And then the last thing on the the... Nordic diet, it's under publication. So it's, I cannot give you that yet. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, maraming salamat, Lars. Maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. And tomorrow we will have another interesting discussion with Dr. Gordana Panich from the University of Southampton. And after that, I will be giving an intro to mass spectrometry based uh, metabolomics analysis, more on yeah principles of mass spectrometry. And with that, I think we can now close this meeting. Uh, thank you. Maraming salamat, Jacobs. Thank you. Thank you. Maraming salamat po sa lahat. Thank you, everyone, time. and have a great day. See you tomorrow for the third episode of Omega Sana Lecture Series. Keep safe, everyone. Thank you, Lars. Thank you. Bye-bye.